Bombs are things that explode, and on July 16th, 1945, the mother of all bombs was created. Instead of using good old TNT, a group of scientists led by J. Robert Oppenheimer managed to do something extremely complex. They harnessed the power of the atom, making the very first atomic bomb. And the results of the Manhattan Project would produce weapons of mass destruction so ridiculously powerful that they could literally destroy the world if misused, which is a terrifying thought. And that's what most people focus on when they think about atomic bombs, the destructive potential that they're capable of. But did you know that a lot of the advances that we have in medicine today can all be traced back to the Manhattan Project? I didn't, and so after watching Oppenheimer, I made this video to explain. On July 16th, 1945, the first nuclear bomb was detonated in Los Alamos, New Mexico. A few months later, on August 6th of that same year, the second bomb would be detonated over Hiroshima, and then a third over Nagasaki as a means to end World War II. No atomic bomb has been used as a weapon of war ever since, and the world was never the same. Literally, as radioactive particles spread across the atmosphere. On the ground in Hiroshima, though, there was a different first taking place. Immediately after the bomb went off, thousands of injured people made their way to the one hospital that was still functioning to see the one doctor that was still uninjured after the blast. This was Terafumi Sasaki, a 25-year-old doctor in the Hiroshima Red Cross Hospital, who was so overwhelmed by the massive influx of people that it's said that he became basically a robot. Wiping, dabbing, suturing, over and over and over again. The amount of patients, incomprehensible. And the amount of help, not that much. Around 90% of all healthcare workers died during the initial bomb blast. He's on autopilot for the next three days, working on patients, barely resting until he catches a break and his body crashes for 17 hours. After that, he gets back up, makes his way back to the hospital and starts to notice a very particular pattern in some of the patients that they've been treating. First, they get an extreme fever over 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius. Then they would lose all of their hair and show signs of a very serious oral infection to the point that the inside of their mouth started to turn black. Finally, they would get a bunch of these little tiny purple dots all over the skin, shortly followed by bleeding and death. Remember, at this point in time, our knowledge on the effects of radiation on the human body were still at its infancy. Nobody knew exactly why so many people were dying, even after making out of the explosion alive. Nobody knew how to treat the significant damage that these people's bodies were going through. For the next few days, Dr. Sasaki's and other doctors' observations would be used to describe a new condition, something which they called atomic bomb syndrome. Midori Naka, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, is a Japanese actress who survived the explosion, but passed away 18 days later due to atomic bomb syndrome. She would be the first person to officially die from this new disease, which today goes by a different name, acute radiation syndrome. This is a condition that has thankfully not been seen in massive numbers outside of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Chernobyl. The story of the Japanese doctors and the patients who survived World War II doesn't end there, but we'll come back to that. For now, it is 1946. And after the end of World War II, the Manhattan Project had accomplished its goal, but the infrastructure remained. Laboratories had been built, atoms had been split, and an entire new world of research was opened up. A very important city in America at the time was Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Not because it was in Tennessee, but because a few years earlier, the United States government had bought up the entire plot of land. They bought an entire city to make a very sophisticated laboratory that they would need to make weapons grade plutonium that was necessary to keep the Manhattan Project running. Until the end of World War II, this place basically functioned as a secret military base. They even went as far as to name it Oak Ridge, which was a suggestion from the workers there, to make it seem more rural and totally not suspicious at all, because after all, if you hear the name Oak Ridge, Tennessee, you probably don't think weapons grade plutonium. After World War II though, the demand for weapons grade plutonium went down. The lab then kind of shifted gears. Instead of making this weapons grade plutonium, they started making radioisotopes that could be used for research. It didn't take very long for it to be a breakthrough. That same year, a paper was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association on the successful treatment of thyroid cancer using those radioisotopes. It proved that even though radiation was incredibly damaging and toxic to the human body, it could 
potentially also be used to heal. And that kind of made things a little bit complicated in terms of ethics, but not as complicated as my podcast, Beyond the Stethoscope, where I have a chat with my friend Ruchi every week on different medical topics like the atom bomb and like AI in medicine, and kind of relate that to our time in medical school. If you'd like to give a listen, I'll put the link in the description below. But anyways, shortly after these radioisotopes were sent to different laboratories and people sussed out that you could actually use radiation as a means to heal, that kind of went against one of the major tenets of practicing medicine, which is non-maleficence, basically meaning don't harm the patient. So on the one hand, radiation is toxic and super not good for the body. On the other hand, if used properly, it can potentially heal the patient by hurting them just a little bit. And this is how the 1950s concept of ALARA started to come around. ALARA stands for as low as reasonably achievable. In other words, we know that radiation does damage, but we also know that without this damage, there are some conditions that we can't actually heal. Some patients do require or could benefit from the use of some amount of radiation in their treatment. Because the benefits in some scenarios outweigh the cost, it was accepted that you could and were able to use as low as reasonably possible an amount of radiation to help someone overcome a condition. This is something that we actually go through in medical school in year one and something that is continually considered when giving patients options for certain treatments, especially after this post-World War II nuclear age of medicine. And this is because throughout the Manhattan Project, scientists continually developed better ways to measure radiation and using that experience combined with the ability to study radioisotopes, the development of today's most impressive medical procedures was possible. Two quick examples of this are, first of all, PET scans, which basically you intake a radioisotope that has been attached to a very specific molecule. Once this is in your body, that molecule will go to certain areas and then a sensor around you can tell off how much radiation you're giving off and can specifically detect where those radioisotopes are and therefore detect things like cancer and track physiological activity inside the body. Gamma knives, on the other hand, is my other example, and they're not like tiny little lightsaber knives knives, which is kind of what I was picturing. It's actually a very focused laser beam um, using radiation to basically destroy malignant cells inside the body without having to make a cut and going in. This is crazy stuff all on the back of the massive scientist scientific process that was made in the Manhattan Project and that has helped us cure conditions that before were completely uncurable and we had no idea how to even approach. This field of study was so big that it became a new specialty and was officially recognized in 1971 as nuclear medicine. For the last part of this video, I wanted to end it by coming back to Japan. The aftermath of the atomic bombs not only caused a large amount of damage and death to two different cities, but also stigmatized those who had been exposed to the atomic bomb. Heibakusha, which again, hopefully I'm pronouncing right, roughly translates to bomb affected people. And that's what these individuals, these survivors of the atomic bombs would be labeled as. It'd be really hard for some of them to find work or start relationships. Being a Heibakusha, from what I understand, from what I've read, is a very difficult stigma to bear, especially after surviving some of the worst effects that a war can bring. Some of these survivors, along with a mixture of US and Japanese scientists, would eventually form what today is known as the Radiation Effects Research Foundation, or RERF for short. They started their work immediately at the end of World War II, and what they've managed to do is actually quite miraculous. They've tracked down almost every single atomic bomb survivor, pinpointed exactly where they were standing at the time of impact, roughly speaking, and also calculated exactly how much radiation their body received from the impact, as well as obviously following up with them throughout their lives. And they've done this and are still continuing to do so for a few different reasons. First of all, it's obviously to help the survivors of the bombings by tracking them and following up with these people continually for the rest of their lives. Lives, they're better able to treat any post-radiation complications that may come up throughout their lives. Second of all, it's to document the effects of radiation on the human body and continuing to follow up with that and seeing if the children of these survivors were affected by any of that radiation. And thirdly, in general, their mission is to enhance the healthcare of humankind. And you can see these missions and all of the research that they've published and have continued to publish on their website today. 
The RERF data has been especially useful for determining the safety standards that we have for radiation today, and also for understanding the very long-term outcomes of radiation exposure. All thanks to the survivors, both hurt by the war and stigmatized after the war, who volunteered their precious time for the betterment of mankind. Thank you for watching.